This is our first practice problem for working with z-scores. We're going to compare Julie and Samuel, who are in two different statistics courses, and they each just had their first exam. Julie got a 70 on her exam, and Samuel got a 46 on his. At first glance, it looks like Julie's doing a lot better in her statistics class than Samuel is, but we're going to use standard deviations and z-scores to figure out if that's actually true. So we now know that Julie's exam has a mean of 65 and a standard deviation of 15, while Samuel's exam has a mean of 43 and a standard deviation of 9. So the question is, which one is actually doing better in statistics according to their z-scores? Next, you'll find out about George. If George got a score of 80 in Julie's class, what would be the equivalent score in Samuel's class? So we'll answer these questions one at a time, but for both we'll be using the classic Z formula, where Z equals the score minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. So I'm going to take this information and write it down on the page on which I'll be doing my work. So here we now have Julie's score with the mean from her class and the standard deviation from her class, as well as Samuel's score with his mean and his standard deviation from his class. So we'll simply compute the z-score for each student and then compare their z-scores to one another to see which one is actually doing better in their statistics class. So for Julie, we don't know her z, that's what we're trying to figure out. What we do know is her score, as well as her mean and her standard deviation. What this gives us is 5 over 15. If you reduce that, it's one third, or 0.333. In statistics, we work with decimals. Okay, now let's figure out Samuel's z-score. We'll use the same formula. We don't know his z, but we do know his score and his mean, and of course, his standard deviation. This gives us three over nine. You'll notice that's the same as one third, or 0.333. So what we find out is that they're actually doing equally well in their statistics courses in terms of the means and standard deviations. They both have a z-score of 0.333. So even though at first glance it looks like Julia is doing a lot better than Samuel, now we can actually compare them in relation to their own distributions and see whether or not they're actually, one is actually doing better than the other. So this is what I mean by being able to compare apples to oranges. Okay, next we'll work on George, who got a score of 80 in Julie's class, and we want to know what the equivalent score would be in Samuel's class. So I'll go ahead and copy that information down to work on that problem. Okay, so here I have George's score, which is an 80, and I have the same mean and standard deviation as I did for Julie because he's in her class. So that's the distribution that he's a part of. So we'll be using those numbers. Now, the first thing we need to do to figure out what the corresponding grade is in Samuel's class is to find out George's z-score. So we'll use the same method we were using before. We have a score of 80, we subtract our mean, and we divide by 15. In this case, we have 15 over 15, or a z-score of 1. Now, to find out the equivalent in Samuel's class, we simply figure out what the z-score corresponds to in terms of a raw score. So in the other class, we have a mean of 43 and a standard deviation of 9. So now, we know the z-score, what we don't know is the raw score. So we'll set our z-score equal to x minus 43 
all over 9. Now we simply solve for x. So we have 9 on the left, x minus 43 on the right. We add 43 to both sides, and we get 52. So now we know that if George had been in Samuel's class instead of Julie's, he probably would have scored a 52. Or in other words, a 52 is equivalent to a score of 80 in the other class. Again, we're able to compare apples to oranges. So when you are working with z-scores, you often don't know either the z-score, which is what you're trying to figure out, or the raw score. So you'll usually have all three other numbers or a way to find them. So when you're first looking at a z-score problem, make sure that you ask yourself, what is it that I'm eventually solving for and how can I get there? Is it my z? Is it my raw score? And then move on to what you need to do. Okay, let's work on one more problem. Okay, here we have a somewhat more complex problem. Suppose you are researching the effect of depression on health. You've gathered a sample of people who have been diagnosed with depression, and you ask them to run a 40-yard dash. You collect their time to run the 40-yard dash in seconds, and you have the data below. Using these values, calculate the raw scores at z equals negative 1 and z equals positive 1. In addition, what is the z-score of the underlined score in the sample? In this case, that's 12.1. And I've given you a hint. Here, all we have is raw data. And so we're going to have to do a lot of calculations in order to finally get to those raw scores that correspond to those z-scores. So in order to make it a little bit easier on yourself, because these are decimals and it can get a little hairy, you should use the computational formula to compute your sum of squares. And we'll go ahead and use that as we work on the problem. So I'll start to copy over this information and start calculating some raw scores. So here I have the raw data now as a list that I can more easily work with, as well as the definition for, or I'm sorry, the formula for my z-score. Now you'll notice that we're missing a couple things here. So first, we're missing our mean. But that we can easily calculate, right? We simply add up our scores and divide by the number of scores. What we really don't have is our standard deviation. And that's what's going to take a little bit longer to calculate. So if you remember, the way that we calculate standard deviation is by taking the square root of our variance, which is sum of squares divided by n minus 1. In this case, we're dividing by n minus 1 because this is a sample. This is not all depressed people running a 40-yard dash. It's only a few people out of that population. So now we have the formula for our standard deviation, but even within this formula, we're missing some stuff. We definitely have our n, but we, we don't have is our sum of squares. Okay. So let's remember the formula for our sum of squares. So our sum of squares, using our computational formula, is the sum of x squared minus the sum of x all squared, remember those are going to be two different numbers, divided by n. Okay, well here we definitely have everything we need, right? x is only referring to the scores, and n is simply the number of scores that we have. So we can definitely figure out our sum of squares so that we can figure out our standard deviation so that we can then figure out the z-scores, or the raw scores that would go with those z-scores. Okay, 
So a lot of calculations, but nothing that we can't do. So we'll start by figuring out our sum of squares. So in order to figure out our sum of squares, oop, I forgot my square here, we're going to have to both sum our scores as well as square each score and then sum those squared scores. So for example, for 10.2, if we square that, we come up with 104.04. For 9.1, it's 82.81, and so on. So I'll go ahead and fill in those squares so that we can sum those. So I've gone ahead and squared each one of my scores. And if I sum all of those numbers, I get 709.44. So that gives me this number here. But now we need to also find the sum of x, so adding up all our scores, and square that. So if we add up all of our scores, we get 72.6. And if we square that, we get 5,270.76. Okay, so now we have this number, which is here. Okay, so now to find our sum of squares, we simply plug in our numbers. So sum of squares equals our sum of x squared, which is 709.44, minus 5,270.76, oh, my handwriting is getting atrocious, <laughs> divided by the number in our sample. In this case, it's 8. So if we go ahead and plug that into the calculator, what we get is a sum of squares of 50.595. Okay, so our first step is done. We have our sum of squares, but we really want our standard deviation. So remember that our standard deviation is going to equal the square root of our sum of squares, which we just figured out, divided by, remember, n minus 1. So in this case, we are going to divide it by 7. And that gives us a standard deviation of 2.688. So in this particular sample, which we hope represents the population, we have a standard deviation of 2.688. So that's one of the numbers that we're going to need uh, to figure out this, uh, this particular problem. So let's go ahead and grab a new page and keep working. Okay, so from that last page, we were able to figure out that our standard deviation is 2.688. So we have one number so far. And if you think about it, we also have the z-scores that we're going to need to figure out, right? Because that's going to equal 1 and negative one. Those are the ones that we're trying to figure out. So, okay, well, we know we're going to have to figure out two raw scores that correspond to both 1.00 and negative 1.00. So now the last thing we really need to figure out is simply the mean. So to figure out the mean, we simply add up all our scores and divide by the number of scores we have. So it's simply sum of x over n, which in this case equals 72.6 divided by 8, and that gives us a mean of 9.075. So I'll go ahead and fill that in here. So when you think about it, what we're trying to find out is on this particular distribution with a mean of 9.075, and a standard deviation of 2.688, what are the values that fall at z equals 1, 
and z equals negative 1. That's all we're trying to figure out. <laughs> all right, so all we're going to do is plug in the numbers that we have to figure out what those raw scores would be. So for z equals, we'll go on this side, negative 1. We don't know the score. That's the whole point that we're trying to figure out. We know our mean, and we know our standard deviation. So now all we have to do is solve for x, right? So go ahead and solve for x, and let me know what you get. So in this case, x should equal 6.387. Now, some students get slightly confused because they think, oh, but it's a negative z, so shouldn't it be a negative number? No, remember that a negative z simply tells us that that number happens to be below the mean, right? So it needs to be below the mean, not necessarily negative. And in this case, Yes, we have a number that's below the mean at 6.387. So now we'll figure out the other side of it. So 1 equals x, that's what we're trying to figure out, minus our mean, 9.075, all over our standard deviation, which is 2.688. And we'll go ahead and solve for x again. So go ahead and manipulate all the numbers until you have x by itself. What you should get is that the number is 11.763. And that makes sense because that's above the mean of 9.075. So hopefully you've been able to follow um, all of this crazy writing to find that the scores that match one standard deviation below the mean and one standard deviation above the mean are these numbers here. In other words, the z-scores of negative 1 and positive 1 correspond to these numbers here. And why would we want to know that? Well, if you remember the empirical rule, that means that 68% of our population is within these two times. So if we recruited our sample correctly, it should represent our population, which means that 68% of our population that's been diagnosed with depression would run the 40-yard dash somewhere between 6.387 seconds and 11.763 seconds. Now, this might not be that important to you, but for someone who is looking at depression and health, this may be very important. For example, how does that compare to the population that is not diagnosed with depression? All right, so hopefully this explained a little bit more about the process to find a z-score or a raw score and showed you that sometimes you just have to take a few steps back, but you can always calculate z-scores using raw data. It's just that sometimes you have to go through finding the sum of squares to find standard deviation and so you can finally get back to the z formula. But you can get there and the math is not hard, it's just tedious. And I would recommend trying to keep it as organized as possible and keep all of your steps in order so if anything does happen to go wrong, you can go back and try and figure out which step was the one that made it go wrong. Um, if not, your professor can also look at your steps and figure out where it went wrong. And that's much easier than having to recreate what you did in your mind um, when you go in to ask a question. So again, organization is one of the biggest things that's going to help you in statistics, especially when you have to calculate many, many uh, numbers to get to the final answer that you're looking for. Let us know if you have any questions. I hope you're enjoying Z-scores as much as I enjoy teaching about them. You can compare apples to oranges. Thanks, guys.